And now I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Eric Jardine. As John mentioned, he's Assistant Professor of Political Science at Virginia Tech and a Senior Fellow at the Center for International Government's Innovation. And as John mentioned, a fellow Canadian. He's the author of over 15 scholarly articles on various dimensions of cyber risk, uh, the dark web and cyber deterrence. In 2017, he and Fen Hansen wrote a book called, and listen to this title, Look Who's Watching, Surveillance, Treachery, and Trust Online. So I'm sure that's, that's probably pretty eye-opening, if not terrifying, uh, if we were to get into that. Um, Dr. Jardine teaches at Virginia Tech, uh, a course on policy dimensions of the dark web, cybersecurity, and internet governance. He recently launched a series of dark web consultation and training sessions for local and state law enforcement. More information can be found at his website, measuringcyber.com. So now I'll give a brief description of uh, the uh, uh, actual presentation and I'll let um, Eric get right into it. So the dark web is a portion of the internet filled with malicious content that is anonymous by design. Hacker forums discuss the latest techniques and point to tantalizing targets while markets sell state-of-the-art hacking tools and massive databases of stolen personal information. A number of personal and professional cyber risks emanate from the dark web and have severe consequences for both individuals and businesses, large and small. This talk describes the dark web, how it is used by malicious actors, and what individuals and businesses can do to minimize the cyber risk in a world of constant interconnection, ubiquitous data, and unprecedented, unprecedented reliance on IT systems. And as John mentioned, there's a rare opportunity to actually do a live Q&A with Dr. Jardine after the presentation. So make your notes, get your questions ready, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Jardine now. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Carson. Uh, before I begin, I just wanted to uh, add my thanks to the CO Global Network and to the McKinsey Institute for hosting me. Uh, it's really my privilege to do events like this, so it's really my treat to be here and I hope uh, we can have a nice conversation over the course of the hour. So I will share my screen, which has all of my uh, fun PowerPoint slides prepared. And I was at the end of the talk, there we go. Uh, so as Karsten said, we're gonna roughly focus on the dark web and its implications. Uh, and that means sort of covering issues to do with, um, uh, issues to do with the talk uh, what it what the dark web means with regards to uh, cyber threats as they particularly affect businesses and individuals. Uh, I'm going to unpack the way in which the dark web acts as a facilitator for all parts of the uh, cyber risk or cyber attack cycle. And in particular, if you wanted to think in terms of discrete questions, there's really going to be three sets. You have at the beginning sort of a descriptive overview of what the dark web is, how it works, what kind of content's available on there. That's not specifically honed in to uh, cyber threats necessarily. I wanted to cast a wider net in case people's interest areas happen to be broader. Uh, much of my research focuses on, for example, uh, dark web based drug markets and things of that sort. So I'm happy to sort of unpack in the Q&A portion any and all aspects of that particular uh, set of questions. The second portion really focuses on uh, three examples uh, of significant cyber attacks that have involved um, the dark web in some capacity, either the dark web before the attack occurred, the dark web during the attack as it occurred, or the dark web uh, as a facilitator of crime after the attack has occurred. And then I'll end with um, a discussion about what businesses in particular, but also individuals to a degree, can do to actually protect themselves and their devices from uh, threats that emanate from the dark web. All right, so to begin at the most high level, uh, what is the dark web? There's a lot of conceptual and terminological confusion in this respect. Um, you know, there's probably many of you may have seen the sort of picture of the iceberg analogy for the internet where you have the surface web, all the sites we visit on a daily basis, the deep web, and then a small little portion at the bottom called the dark web. Uh, that's crudely accurate. Uh, the deep web is the portion of the internet that's not indexed or searchable by Google. Um, that involves, for example, a lot of corporate intranets, academic databases that are behind paywalls, things that I, most people would not consider to be illicit or any sort of threat per se. When you move into the dark web, you start to move into different territory. 
you still have a, a, a set of sites and, and content that is largely unindexed, but it's also uh, anonymous by design. And so when you think about the dark web, it's really useful to think in two broad terms. Um, and I'll focus most of my conversation on the Tor hosted dark web is one among many, but it's the most popular. Uh, if you're think, thinking in terms of what goes on in the dark web, you have users like you have on any part of the internet. They would use, for example, the Tor browser here, which is downloadable from the Tor project website, uh, runs on a, the search engine DuckDuckGo and is anonymous by design. We'll talk about what that means in a second. And then you've got what the Tor project now calls onion services, what were previously called hidden services, and which are essentially sites that are hosted internal to the Tor network. And these sites are uh, identifiable because they're a string of alphanumeric characters ending in dot onion as opposed to something clear like cnn.com or espn.ca or whatever. Um, so if you run into a dot onion site, you're running into a darknet site, but you're not going to be able to reach it unless you're using the Tor browser because, as I said, these particular sites are hosted internal to the Tor network. And the big defining feature, as I mentioned, is that everything we're talking about is sort of shrouded in a cloak of anonymity. That means users using the Tor browser are anonymous to the sites that they're visiting, which in this context essentially means their IP address is not publicly available or knowable. And the Onion services being hosted internal to the Tor network imply that the users accessing the site don't know who's running it, that the location of the server hosting the site is also anonymous, which is a key feature or impediment to law enforcement efforts to try to police these, these, this content. Uh, because the site could be hosted in any country, and if you can't find the country, you can't use, say, the MLAT process to uh, try to actually take the site down or commandeer it. Law enforcement have been able to do that, and we can talk about ways in which law enforcement have been effective at policing certain parts of the dark net um, during the course of the Q&A, if you'd like. Um, but it's a ch more of a challenge than if you're dealing with a surface website with a known domain provider and all the rest. So before moving into a discussion of content, I want to just step back and talk through a little bit about how anonymity is actually produced in the system. It's fine to say it's anonymous. If you wanted to have one big takeaway away about what the dark web is, you could just say it's the anonymous portion of the internet. But in terms of its functionality, it's, it's, it's so ingeniously simple that it's useful to sort of dwell on for a moment. Uh, if you imagined two people, in this case, Alice and Bob, one is, uh, the person, the user, the person trying to gain access to content using the Tor browser, that would be Alice. And the other is Bob. Bob is the person hosting content. This could be on the surface web. It could be, it could be the McKinsey Institute website. It could be CNN. It could be also an onion service hosted internal to Tor. In any, in any eventuality, what you basically have is Bob hosting content, Alice wanting to view that content. In a typical internet connection, you're going to have a more or less direct connection between the two of these, which would mean that Bob could record Alice's IP address and Alice would not be anonymous in any meaningful sense of the term. By using the Tor browser, Alice essentially gains access to the Tor overlay network, which sits basically on top of the infrastructure of the internet and is sort of an, uh, exemplified by this, uh, these nine computers in the middle. There are in reality about 6,000 to 6,500 volunteered nodes that are make up the Tor network and they're kind of distributed fairly unevenly, but they're distributed globally, uh, making the network somewhat resilient to efforts to try to block or censor it. When Alice enters this network, she proceeds along the green path, which is an encrypted line that's been randomly chosen through the Tor network. At the last end, with those exit nodes, information is queried from Bob's site. Bob will be able to record the IP address of that last node, that exit node, but doesn't know Alice. So if you think about this network structure from a malicious actor perspective, and I mean that malicious in the, in the sense of trying to compromise the anonymity, not necessarily a malicious hacker per se, but if you're trying to compromise the anonymity of the system, you need to gain access to a lot of nodes in order to actually figure out um, the identity of Alice. So if you gain access to the last node, you'd be able to see the metadata and the content for the, for the site you're querying. So you know what somebody's viewing, what's hosted by Bob. You might be able to also know the, the, the node prior if, the, if this exit node has been compromised, but that node prior, that one in the middle of that grid, all that that node knows is the node before it and the node after it. And so you actually need to gain 
uh, gain access to or, or control of a large amount of nodes if you actually want to de-anonymize specific users, which is quite a challenge for most beyond perhaps the largest government actors. And so it's through this simple system that you basically take Alice's originating IP address and just sort of disassociate it from any kind of content that Alice is having happens to be engaging with. And so when we're talking about anonymity on the dark web, that's what we're really talking about. It's sort of the disassociation of the IP address based identity, which is sort of core to um, knowing who's doing what on the, the rest of the internet and the rest of the World Wide Web. Um, there's obvious ways in which individuals could disclose things on sites and make themselves non-anonymous. That would happen and does happen. Um, but th at its core, when we're talking about the anonymity of Tor and the anonymity of the dark web, this is what we're talking about, this sort of anonymity by design, by relaying hops through nodes that are spread out geographically. So I mentioned those onion services before, these things that could theoretically be hosted by Bob and accessed by Alice. And there's a wide range of available content. Uh, as a moving average, you probably have about 65 to 70,000 Onion services up at any given day, uh, which is a tiny fraction of the number of sites that are obviously available on the surface web. Um, and, but this number is increasing over time, which is a sort of point in the favor of an expanding dark web. At the same time, the rate of churn among these sites is fairly high, so any given sites An overview just to give you a sense of what we're talking about when we talk about those onion services. So the uh, one example is uh, sites that basically aggregate products for sale. These could be discrete marketplaces, they could also be linked based sites like this one. Uh, what I always find interesting to point out in this sort of context is you'll note the thumbs up thumbs down structure surrounded by things as various as sales of vulnerabilities, lists of links to Tor, plus hacked counts from Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and all the rest. These thumbs up, thumbs down, I think are, are useful sort of microcosms of the broader e-commerce based uh, trappings that are all over the dark web. So when you have uh, asynchronous transactions, when you have unknowable actors, and you sometimes have illicit content involved, you have massive trust deficits and problems, the same thing that eBay and Amazon and everyone needed to overcome in the early years of e-commerce. And they came up with the solution of, well, we'll rate vendors, we'll rate products, we'll let the crowd voice their opinions about uh, products and about services. And through that mechanism, we'll develop sort of a crowd-based trust that's infused into the system. And all of those e-commerce innovations have basically trickled down into the dark web as well. The only reason drug crypto markets, for example, work and here's an example of one that my students and I uh, visit during the, one of the courses that Karsten mentioned in the beginning. Um, the only reason sites like this work is because they're able to leverage e-commerce innovations to, to sort of close the trust deficit that would be endemic to a situation where you're dealing with illegal products on an anonymous network and asynchronous transactions. That's sort of like a recipe for nobody's gonna trust anybody, but they make it work because they use escrows, because they use product ratings, because they use vendor ratings. So you have these interesting sort of pockets of uh, techno technological diffusion that are all taking all these innovations from the legitimate sectors of the economy and sort of porting them into the illegitimate sectors of the economy. Another example is sort of aggregating sites where you have some combination of everything from news through aggregated links. So the dark web is notoriously difficult to navigate. Part of that is the problem of um, the rate of churn that I mentioned before. If the sites aren't constant, it's kind of hard to go back to them. Part of it also has to do with how easy it is to uh, DDoS attack sites that are internal to the Tor network. And part of it has to do with just these things are transient by nature. People set them up and then walk away and all that sort of thing. And since not, it's very poorly indexed, there are a few search engines like Not Evil that try to uh, let you do keyword searches for darknet content, but they're pretty terrible. And so what usually happens is you'll end up with list aggregating sites or link aggregating sites like you see in the sort of left hand side of this pane that essentially take links, put them into categories and then display that publicly for individuals. And sometimes these are hosted on the dark web. Sometimes they're also hosted on the surface web. So there was a site 
called deep.web that was taken down in the spring of 2019. And that site was notorious for aggregating onion links. And it ended up getting taken down because, uh, and the, the, or the administrators were arrested with the charge that they were facilitating or profiting from illegal activities because they were hosting uh, drug marketplace links. And so that was the charge used to basically remove that site. But in the grand spectrum of things, it also doesn't matter because the same sort of content and link aggregation is readily available on the dark net itself, which is where I got this picture uh, yesterday. At the same time that you have these sort of malicious levels of, of content, you also have, of course, something like Facebook. Uh, and you can tell it is the Facebook iteration of the uh, of their popular social media platform and not the service web by looking at the domain in the, in the address bar, which ends in dot onion. And so you end up uh, at, you can access to uh, Facebook and all of its sort of trappings through the Tor network, as opposed to doing so um, directly via say your normal browser. Although the, you know, the accessing a social media platform based on real identity policies through an anonymous network it kind of seems on one level to be a bit of a weird course of action. It is designed um, partially to allow people in restrict regimes with restrictive content uh, rules in place to get access to the social media site and partially to parse traffic in a way that lets Facebook uh, sort of ease its own traffic burdens so they don't need to manage uh, traffic from the Tor network. But my point is that there's a wide range of content. If we sort of scale up to 10,000 feet, there's also been efforts to kind of index available content in a way that would let you sort of talk about it in more thematic buckets. And one of the better examples is um, a study by Owen and Savage from 2015, where these two who are computer scientists over in the UK actually ran 60 nodes in the Tor network. So that original nine computers, they were basically running those nodes. And as a part of that, they were able to then categorize, pull down plain text and categorize hidden services or onion services that were hosted internal to those systems. What they basically found was a wide variety of content, uh, drugs being the most prevalent, markets and fraud related sites being the second most prevalent. Um, at, the, at the lower end, gambling, guns, chat sites, news sites, child abuse imagery sites, those were all on the lower end of available content. Uh, for our purposes, I think a couple to focus on would be the sites dedicated to hosting, hacking, uh, fraud, and markets. These are sort of the bundle of sites that would sort of make up the the main points of the main points of facilitation for cyber-based crime. That you have, you know, hacking for services falls into the hacking category. Renting distributed denial of service uh, attack minutes would fall into potentially the market category, the whole hacking category, that sort of thing. Fraud would often involve the, the sale of stolen identity credentials. So there's a wide range of content. I'm happy to talk about um, some additional findings about how traffic actually goes to these sites if people are interested in the Q&A. But for the purposes of the rest of the talk, we'll sort of focus in on these four broad buckets, which collectively make up um, a fair sort of size proportion of available content as they'd indexed it back in 2015. All right, so what we'll do in going through the sort of dark web as a facilitator for cyber attacks is really look through an example before of the way in which the dark web facilitates uh, cyber attacks from before the attack has happened, sort of acts as a catalyst, the way in which it can be supported during the course of an attack, and then also the way in which it might matter after the attack. And in, in each of these cases, the dark web matters in a slightly different way, but it's, there's some certainly some degrees of overlap at play as well. So the example I point to for um, the before the attack is the 2017 WannaCry ransomware attack. A lot of people I would assume on this call have heard of ransomware, might have even been affected by ransomware, um, which is essentially a form of a malicious script that if it gets onto your network or machine, will start to encrypt files and, and encrypt your devices, preventing you from using them. Uh, you're then shown a splash screen, which basically says, pay us or else you don't get your data back with a ticking clock. Um, uh, it used to be small towns were getting hit. More recently, uh, Baltimore was a, a hit with ransomware. Atlanta's been hit with ransomware uh, and suffered fairly sizable price tags as a result of that. Um, the WannaCry attack was unusual and sort of points to our uh, sort of uh, 
role or points to the role of the dark web as a facilitator in that it originated in an exploit that was originally stolen by a group calling themselves the shadow brokers and then dumped online so it was originally dumped online in early 2017 on a paste bin and uh, github repository but then very quickly sort of proliferated through uh, the dark web and the, the exploit that underlies WannaCry is this one highlighted here called Eternal Blue, uh, which was essentially an exploit in earlier Windows operating systems, uh, which poses a problem that I'll point to in, a, in a, a little bit. So the WannaCry ransomware basically ended up infecting computers and presenting this sort of screen, where you had a Bitcoin address to pay the money to, you had $300 worth of Bitcoin that had to be paid, you had a ticking clock, um, that basically pointed to both when payments are going to be increased, so sort of escalating uh, extortion if you don't pay, and then uh, a ticking clock to when the files would basically be destroyed. Now, ran, uh, the WannaCry attack is interesting, I think, because it was able to be weaponized because of the stability with which data was able to be hosted on the dark web. So once it, was, once it got loose in the wild, it basically became more or less permanent. If you post it on a paste bin, if you post it especially in a GitHub repository, there are things actors can do in order to pull that information down potentially. Once it's on the dark web, you have it mirrored across a variety of Onion services, it's not going to go anywhere. So it became a permanent fe feature of the hacker, hacker repertoire. And from there it got exploited fairly quickly leading to this attack. Now why WannaCry is significant is that over the course of like basically a long weekend from May 12th to May 15th, it ended up spreading to over 150 plus countries, affected over 200,000 uh, victims uh, and over 300,000 uh, uh, 300, corporations. Now, now, several places like the National Health Service in the UK were particularly hard hit. And this sort of boiled down to a combination of uh, time zone plus uh, software. So it, given when the attack first started, the North America wasn't quite up and awake at that point. So we had a bit of a, an advantage of coming online with time to start trying to patch. And then also uh, things like the National Health Service in the UK was running predominantly Windows XP on their uh, uh, operating systems for all their imaging technology and things like that, which is also what we do here in North America. Um, but the problem was that this exploit Windows XP was no longer being serviced by Microsoft and this exploit targeted that in a very efficient way. And so you had a prob problem that ended up propagating across most of the globe. It ended up ending in rather inadvertently when a hacker called Malware Tech uh, basically registered the domain that was embedded in the exploit in a, uh, with the purpose of tracking the, the spread of WannaCry. And what ended up happening was he inadvertently hit a kill switch. So this ended on May 15th only because somebody curious did something uh, that resulted in an unexpected outcome. It wasn't that we managed to pull ourselves out of the, the, the nosedive, it was more luck than anything else. Um, uh, there hasn't been a, an attack of the scale since with ransomware, but ransomware as a, as a discrete attack vector has become significantly more pre prevalent. And often it's sort of based on uh, kits that are developed and shared or sold that are hosted in the dark web in a more or less permanent fashion. The dark web can also facilitate uh, attacks during the, their course. And I think a good example of this uh, are botnets. So I want to point in particular to the Mirai botnet, which attacked uh, Dyn in 2016 uh, uh, and other botnets more generally. Um, Um, the sorry, I got distracted by the chat real quick there, but I'm back. Um, the so the Dyn attack is um, is uh, interesting because of its scale again, uh, and also its point of origin. So distributed denial of service attacks essentially bombard servers um, or or devices with so much traffic that they can't reply. So anyone who uses a Mac and has the, the swirling beach volleyball of death, anyone who gets a Windows blue screen 
or anyone who thinks about a disaster movie and when there's uh, an earthquake or an erupting volcano or whatever and the protagonist tries to make the call and says and gets the we're sorry all our lines are busy please try again later they're all sort of pointing to the sort of rough mechanics of what we're talking about with a distributed denial of service attack it's basically send so much traffic in the direction of a server that you take it offline or at a minimum degraded service and that is what happened with the Mirai attack on Dyn. And in this case, it was actually insecure uh, IoT devices. So baby monitors, security cameras, that sort of thing that had been compromised by the Mirai malware put into a botnet, which leveraged all of their processing power into like one big cannon and then launched it at Dyn DNS services. And what that ended up doing was causing massive uh, internet degradation and blackouts in the United States. You had a variety of services Airbnb, CNN, Fox, Wired, BBC, parts of Amazon, that were all sort of degra degraded or knocked offline for a period of time uh, back in October of 2016. Now the Mirai attack as it originally occurred was uh, facilitated by a series of command and control nodes that were hosted on surface, a lot of surface web domains like .ru or .tk. What is the troubling sort of trajectory here though is that you also have uh, you also have a, a resurgence of a trend that was pretty common in the early parts of the last decade, the 2010s, but is resurging again um, now where Tor, and particularly Tor hidden services, are working as command and control nodes. And similar to the proliferation of content um, uh, via uh, Tor marketplaces like that we talked about before, once of these command and control nodes get hosted internal to the Tor network on these onion services, they become incredibly resilient and hard to find. Because as I said, you know, when you're hosting an Onion service, the location of that server that's hosting that content is not known. And so taking remedial steps is significantly more challenging than if it's on a surface web domain. And you can at least pinpoint the geography uh, of the uh, server that's hosting the command and control node. And so this trend basically takes the Mirai, via, Mirai malware and sort of combines uh, a malicious attack that leverages the um, processing power of IoT devices to take down sites and combines it with more secure command and control nodes, which will make them harder to disrupt in the future. So it's sort of the, the, the Tor network in this case is sort of acting as a facilitator or as a host for uh, command and control structures for malicious attacks. And lastly, we have the sort of after the fact, um, uh, we have the dark web playing a role after the fact of an attack. And so in this case, I wanted to highlight the target breach. Uh, so this is target the retailer, uh, which was compromised in this December of 20, uh, or the December shopping season, or the November, December shopping season of 2013, uh, and sort of spread it over into 2014. In this case, what we had was a, an attack that uh, originated in Target's HVAC vendor. Uh, who had credentials to access parts of Target's network and ported with them when they did so uh, some malware that ended up affecting the point of sale devices and a number of Target stores uh, due to Target's own misconfiguration uh, and lack of security procedures. A lot of data was being transmitted for uh, and in an unencrypted way, at least over part of the line. And as a result of that, you ended up with over 40 million credit cards being compromised and up to 70 million uh, bits of personally identifiable information being compromised. Now what's interesting is that information, that 40 million credit cards quickly found its way to dark web markets. So we pointed to the, the counterfeit services and uh, marketplaces hosted in terms of the Tor network. And on those places, that is where uh, researchers such as Brian Krebs ended up finding a bunch of uh, credit cards for sale one of the things that I think is interesting to sort of point out in this respect is that these are markets and they respond to supply, demand, and the quality of the product when determining price. And so from uh, you sort of, in the, in the figure on the left here, you have the sort of declining share of functional cards. Because one of the things that can, will happen when you're talking about credit cards in particular is as soon as it is known that cards are compromised, people start to cancel them, preventing further abuse. A card that has been canceled is basically just a waste of plastic. Um, what, and this is sort of a predictable decline. And so after the breach became known, 
around uh, late December, you see a, a gradual but fairly steady drop in the share, the proportional share of cards that were uh, of that 40 million that remain active and effective. Now, what that did in terms of price was result in about a 70% decline in the, the price for a, an equivalent bundle of credit cards, which go remarkably cheap uh, when you think about um, the kind of damage they can cause at an individual level if you end up with uh, having to work your way through claims processes and things like that. So, for example, the, um, the, the prior to the breach becoming publicly known in, uh, in mid-December, the price for a bundle of credit cards was about $26 to about $44. Um, once uh, you had about two months later, once you had no word of the breach fully uh, out there and people began to ca cancel cards and the share, uh, as indicated, of the uh, functional cards began to decline, you had a 70% reduction to about 8 to $28 for the, an equivalent bundle of uh, priced cards. All this is to say, you know, there these are a lot of malicious actors, state actors, or advanced persistent threat of society respond basically to financial signals. And this is a, I think, a good indication of that, that if they can't make equivalent money, the price goes down because there's no demand. The other thing I'll say before we're moving on to um, a look at sort of the sort of core problems and what can be done uh, is to just say that one of the Problem, one of the reasons in my take of why ransomware has become so popular is because the price per bundle of stolen identity credentials is just so low because of supply. That it's, you know, when we talk about these mega breaches, we're talking about humongous breaches of uh, into the order of millions or billions. And at that scale, the price per unit is terrible. Uh, whereas if you can compromise an individual device and get 300 to $600 for each device you compromise as sort of is the dominant scam with ransomware, um, higher if you're talking about targeting cities or corporations, of course, then you're basically uh, dealing with a, a more effective uh, revenue stream. And so this transition we've seen in recent years from about 2014, 2015, 2016 to today uh, of increasing surges in ransomware is largely due to the fact that we figured out how to monetize it through cryptocurrencies. Um, all right, so if we turn now to the end portion, that last question, what can businesses do to protect themselves? I think I still want to sort of ground what we're talking about in those three examples that we uh, just went through, uh, just so we can see how each example kind of illustrates some sort of challenge and then how we can kind of go from there to uh, uh, point towards solutions. So if we're talking about the WannaCry ransomware attack, that first uh, issue where the dark web is acting as an initial facilitator of, uh, of ransom, uh, facilitator of crime by allowing the easy weaponization and use of uh, exploits. The problem in that case was really the issue of unpatched software. That if you, have, if you were patching Windows XP, if you were patching Windows 7, uh, you were gonna be invulnerable to WannaCry. And recognizing that IT systems are integrated into business processes and that disrupting those business processes just to patch software is sometimes not at the margin, the best business choice. It is nevertheless um, a, a problem when the rubber hits the road and somebody launches a cyber attack. If your software remains unpatched or your hardware remains unupdated, you're going to potentially face uh, the problem that was sort of seen with WannaCry. Where it becomes particularly challenging is when you're dealing with something like unserviced software like XP was at the time of the WannaCry attack. Uh, and to their credit, Microsoft had actually uh, pushed out an internal blue patch, but it still hadn't been sufficiently implemented. So what we, so this isn't a problem that uh, to call any particular organization out. Most organizations have a pretty poor uh, remediation time. Uh, that in order to patch about 50% of vulnerabilities from time to discovery, you're still talking about three to four months. Um, one interesting thing to note is that at the, the, the software providers have kind of split in recent years from those that like that are like Microsoft with Windows 10 that basically don't let cons uh, customers uh, as a default anyways update their own software. They basically say, we're updating it for you. Um, and that's going to be that, um, which contrasts with the earlier like XP service package two mentality where it was like, here are the patches, install them if you want to. Um, companies that have taken a very active hand like Microsoft and Google in terms of 
uh, pushing patches to, to users tend to have far quicker remediation times at the higher end, uh, larger business process companies like IBM, HP, Oracle, Cisco have significantly longer patching times. There's also there's there's service type differences in play as well, but I think it's the, the, the mentality of the companies and how they try to interact and push the patches to consumers matters. But if you fix these problems, if you patch your software, um, you're invulnerable to a given exploit, but there are lots of exploits and I recognize you can't just patch everything because that would sometimes involves system downtime. Uh, really well put on display in the tar target case and that really takes us back to the dark web and that will serve as sort of the end thought for the talk is that, you know, the target breach was first found and discussed in late December, early January by Brian Krebs, who is a security blogger formerly from the Washington Post. And Krebs is great uh, and so he finds lots of stuff. But this isn't an isolated incident. The Yahoo breach of a few billion e email addresses, that was publicly discussed before Yahoo was aware of it by Joseph Cox at Motherboards. And so the point is really that I don't think in an ideal world, the compromised company should be one of the last ones to know that their, their information, be it PII, credit card information, business processes, IP, what have you, is available for sale in the dark web. And all that that essentially means is that you have to, I think, as a, a mature company in today's environment, really work on dark web monitoring, which means looking for any sort of credentials, PII or IP of yours that might be leaking out. And it, uh, uh, I think to end, I think re referencing back to what we saw with the supply demand and price uh, for, the, the, for the records that were stolen during the target breach, by monitoring, you can remediate. And by remediate, you drive down the price and you basically fix the problem faster than if you just try to ignore it. And Yahoo, I think, is a great example. They didn't, they didn't know that it was happening and they lost about 350 million in uh, the Verizon deal as a result of some of the fallout from, from that information eventually becoming disclosed. So with that, I thank you all for your time. I know there's at least one comment that got plopped into the chat and I'll definitely uh, answer that one. And I'm happy, of course, to answer any other questions anyone might have. So thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Eric. That was uh, enlightening. <laughs> it was scary. <laughs> and uh, and, and kind of, you know, a lot of questions come up, uh, you know, based on, uh, based on your presentation. Uh, but uh, so thank you for that. I don't want to cut into uh, uh, questions. I know there are some people that have them. We've only got about five, six minutes for questions. So uh, do you, you do have one in your chat box, do you? Uh, Yes, there was, I think there are two now, so I can quickly go through those. Yeah, maybe quickly uh, go through those. I don't have any in mind. Yep. So uh, Claudio asked, does having your files saved in the cloud, like OneDrive, prevent ransomware issues? Uh, very briefly, absolutely, it can. Um, and so, you know, the prevention with ransomware, very useful. Don't click links, update your software, that kind of thing. Um, if compromised, the best thing you can have in your pocket is a backup. If you can basically just say, I'll, re I'll re restore to factory and then there's reload my files, you're basically safe. Um, and so that is absolutely something that can be done. Um, okay. Battlestar Titan, I like it. Uh, so for question period, what steps can regulators take to enhance uh, cyber governance? What regulator approaches should be adopted? Standards or best practices we would recommend? Can the dark web be governed? So I'm going to take in sort of reverse order. Um, the dark web is incredibly challenging to govern in any kind of effective sense of the term, um, at least in a centralized way, simply because the technology itself is distributed. And so you're trying to basically deal with technology hosted in multiple countries, uh, running on publicly available protocols and that sort of thing. There is, with the Tor hosted dark web anyways, a weak point. And that weak point is that the US government uh, through the National Science Foundation, the Department of State and DOD remains one of the TOR project's biggest funders. And so it's sort of an unexplored question as to whether or not that financial support could ever translate over into leverage with regards to the TOR project, but uh, it is an unexplored sort of avenue. Uh, in terms of broader steps for regulating sort of cyber governments, governance issues, I think the big thing is um, uh, when dealing with regulation and the internet, very generally speaking, the one big worry is you don't want to 
uh, see a problem and think that the only really effective way to deal with this is, is intervention of government. And I say that simply because there are so many private actors involved that run infrastructure, own infrastructure, and essentially make governance choices on a day-to-day -day basis that involvement of government without proper attention to the fact that, for example, all uh, in Canada, that the ISP networks are all essentially owned and operated and governed after a fashion uh, by private entities can run into some pretty serious problems. Um, and so it's not, a, it's not to say government keeps its hands off and just let the private sector do what they will. It's more to say the government has to recognize that private sector will be playing a, uh, a governance role in this space and that the government needs to sort of play to the, its strengths while the private sector plays to theirs. And likewise, you know, there are non-governmental actors and organizations like the IETF that does a lot in terms of standards and protocols, and those are important to sort of bear in mind as well. Um, getting lots here. Where does someone go to see the information is on the dark web? So J Jason's question, it's basically if you wanted to, um, and I didn't embed it in this, but I uh, had contemplated it one early iteration, uh, what you can basically get onto the dark web in a matter of maybe five minutes. So if you were to go to the Tor project, click download browser, unpack that software, it will install the browser on your computer. Um, there are additional steps I would recommend if you wanted to do all this securely, but from that browser, you're basically set to start searching. Now, the next step is obviously just a quick jaunt to a Tor wiki that gives you some sites, and then from there, you're basically gonna find yourself on Onion domains, and you're gonna be anonymously browsing and anonymously hosted content and fully in the dark net. Um, so it's you're like, there isn't one pathway, as my students discovered when, when accessing that, that marketplace yellow brick as part of the sort of educational process, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get onto different sites, a lot of different ways to get on the same site. Um, and, but in terms of its ease, this isn't a particularly challenging or time consuming endeavor. It's really just a matter of a few clicks and generally knowing a little bit about what you're doing. Um, Eric, Eric, uh, excuse me. I've got I've got two questions here that have come in in the uh, chat box. Here, one's from uh, sure. one from uh, uh, Mitch Ferre and one from Lou. Uh, maybe we could get to those. Uh, uh, Mitch Ferre has a question. Any recommendations for those of us who have ring doorbells and or home security cameras? Yep, sure. So the basic problem in the Mirai instance, uh, and is the problem in the um, case of the, the Richmond Museum there is. Uh, if it is running with default credentials, it's probably visible to people who want to view it, uh, which has a very easy solution. So as long as the, the, the door, the IoT device, if it's a ring doorbell or anything else that you purchase allows you to update that and allows you to basically log in either through a web portal or housewise to change the credentials, then you're in good shape. If that isn't an advertised feature, then you're going to be by default running admin credentials and that's going to be a problem. And you're gonna run into those issues of your device potentially being commandeered. Yeah, very, very good. Thank you for that. And, and Lou, is, is your question, what about owned uh, websites? Are, there, are they helpful and to what extent is, have I got that question right, Lou? Yeah, so websites like I've been pawned or whatever the name is, are they helpful yeah. to what extent? Um, are they useful to the business environment? Yeah, so they are like the they are useful if you pay attention to what it is you're searching. So, for example, I know I, I remember giving a talk once, and someone mentioned that they they went to the I have I been pwned website and uh, searched their email address, and it turned out their email address was according to this site listed for sale on the dark web. So, the thing is. I could understand how that would be an anxiety producing thing to discover. That makes perfect sense. Um, however, in a lot of cases, and this isn't a uniform rule, but in like the case of my email address, for example, it's publicly listed on the VT website. So in that case, I fully expect my email address is for sale on the dark web. I have a colleague actually who uh, he's built a simulation plus platform for crisis management and it got attacked uh, using all VT emails uh, and a series of brute force attempts at login credentials. 
but it was basically somebody scraped the website for emails and then used that as an attack vector. So my point is these websites can be useful, but you kind of got to think through like what it is you're searching for. If, if it's basically it has a, is a piece of publicly available information about me available on the dark web for sale, and you find that it is, I wouldn't myself find that particularly anxiety producing because it basically means somebody took it from one part of the internet and is now trying to monetize it against your will. It's disconcerting, but it's not a problem. Where you really run into issues um, and where monitoring, dark web monitoring can really be effective is if you're looking for information that shouldn't be publicly available, that you have access to that others shouldn't have access to those are the situations where you're really sort of po pointing to the possibility of some sort of compromise or breach in your network yeah Th thanks a lot eric uh, is there a quick answer to jeff harrington's question of what are your thoughts on ip blockers and then we're going to turn it over to carson to wrap it up uh, is there a quick answer to that on ip blockers eric uh so it, i i guess it would sort of depend on IP blockers in what uh, what sense? Um, if we're talking about blocking traffic from particular IPs, is Jeff? Yeah, Jeff, can you clarify that question? Regular web. So if it is, um, yeah. So if it is, you know, blocking yeah, just, malicious. Just, yeah, just, just blocking from your IP. I'm sorry. Just blocking, but when you go onto websites and whatnot, you don't necessarily want the uh, the websites finding out what your IP is. Oh yeah, yeah yeah. So if you were, you know, I I for example um, am running this whole presentation through my VPN uh, based in Switzerland. That's effectively obfuscating my IP so that um, for regular web traffic, uh, it's all viewed as if my uh, location is in Switzerland. I find it useful um, simply because it's uh, it basically takes a, a piece of information that is relevant for advertising and certain geolocation functions but not relevant for anything I'm going to typically typically want to engage with um, and masks it. So it's just um, my, my personal preference I think in this case is everybody should probably be using a VPN which makes it not very personal more of a generalized statement um, yeah okay thank you oh that's great we're, we're gonna have to wrap up Eric uh, that was just a uh, fantastic thank you thank you so much uh, and someone's asked for your for your website uh, information again just very quickly your website is uh, it is measuring and I'll just I'll drop it into the chat oh, I dropped it privately to Claudio Hold on. Uh, great. Yeah. I'll well, just great. We're, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. Uh, Carson, could you just uh, quickly uh, let everybody know uh, what what we have planned for next week, and uh, uh, and then we'll wrap up uh, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Eric. That was fantastic. I, I have a feeling you could go on for not hours but days. So uh, Eric's contact information is on the screen. Uh, please reach out to Eric. Uh, for next week, we're going to have a gentleman by the name of Dr. Peter Vincent Pry, who's executive director of the EMP Task Force on National and Homeland Security. EMP is Electromagnetic Magnetic Pulse. And uh, he'll be discussing the conventional threats to our electrical grid, i.e. our power supply. Without power, we have, we have no IT problems, um, but we have other ones. So uh, can the lights go out again? Will they go out again? What can we do about it? How can we prepare? Uh, we'll be sending out that invitation shortly. That's going to be on Thursday uh, at 9 a.m. Again, I uh, want to thank the CEO of Global Network uh, and Eric uh, for uh, working with us today. To learn more about the McKenzie Institute, please visit mckenzieinstitute.com.